Okay, so environments. Um, so I put this thing about what are environments and why should I care at the beginning? Because when I was first reading this chapter, that really was my first question. Like, why should I care about these things? Um, maybe they're just like a background thing that like is deep down and like, I'm never gonna have to think about. But I think when we think about environments, I think it also answers a little bit of a question that we were having about the last time we met with lexical scoping. Please maximize the window. Um, I think it is at its max. Can you guys see all right? Yep. Um, so, so, right. So it turns out that environments actually power a lot of really important things in R. So they power R6 version of object-oriented programming, which is in chapter 16. Um, we're going to get there with object-oriented pro programming, but it, it powers one of the versions of object-oriented programming. And when I first read about it, I actually thought about objects and object-oriented things when I first read it, but it's not quite that, apparently. Um, so environments power dplyr and ggplot, apparently. And they also power this handy dandy function in R, which we discussed when we were talking about functions the other day, which is this concept of lexical scoping. So this is this idea of up and down searching for variables. So I've got a little toy function here to kind of illustrate this. Um, so we make a variable x in the global, and then we make a little toy function that takes as its inputs x and y. And we take a second toy function, which only takes the input y. So this function here is going to take x and y and add x plus y, as is this one. So when we actually evaluate these, toy function one, when it runs, it thinks x is two because we've put in x equals two here. It will add two plus three and give us five compared to toy function y, which doesn't take in an x variable, but still doesn't give us an error. And it thinks it doesn't have an x. So it looks to the global and it thinks x is 10. So it would return 10 plus 3 is 13. So this was kind of a, a, a bridge from two weeks ago when we spoke about the idea of lexical scoping and functions and how this works. So this whole ability of functions to do this is powered by the concept of environments in ours. So what exactly is an environment? The way I've been thinking about it is that it's essentially an unordered bag of bindings between names and values. And these bags of bindings can be basically anything. So you can bind a character, you can bind um, a vector, you can bind a Boolean, you can bind, you can bind a numerical. Um, it can be pretty much anything. So, it's different from a named list in a couple of ways. So at first you might think that it's kind of like a named list. You've got a bunch of things that all have names. You can call them back by their names. So it's different from a named list and it's different in a couple of ways. First, every name has to be unique and every item must have a name because without a binding to your environment, then you don't have anything. So everything must be named. Um, there's no ordering to this names. So just because you create something first when you're making it doesn't mean it's first. You can't retrieve things like you would with a named list where you do double brackets one. All environments have a parent, um, except for one, and we'll get to that. And we'll also get to what exactly a parent is. And environments are also modified in place. So this is important when we think about earlier chapters where we're basically seeing how R can sometimes be slow when you do things in loops because it will copy things all the time. Um, environments were the exception to that rule about copy on modify, which is they are modified in place. So it's fairly simple to create environment. You can also do it in base R, but the book recommended that you don't use the base R way of doing it. So I haven't even included how to do it. Um, the way he recommended was using the Rlang library. So you create it like this um, as you would create Anything, you assign it, rlang environment, um, and you can bind like this. These are your bindings, this is how you bind to them. You can push new objects here using the assignment category. So even though E1 didn't have anything called Z before, I can give it a new thing called fish. 
And then we can actually see what's inside of our environment by using environment print. So if I call environment print E1, um, we see that this is the environment, this is its uh, ID in memory, and it gives us information about its parent, it's in the global, um, and its bindings are currently Z, A, B, C, D. Um, that's not right. It should also say fish. Um, we can get the names of the environment like this. And da, 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 da. so do you think the following code chunk is going to run? I guess in line 10, it will be a problem because uh, you cannot access any elements with the numbers. Wah, wah. Ta -da! Yay, okay. So that's one thing to keep in mind when we're trying to work with environments. So even though you didn't know it maybe until this point, you've actually been working with environments all this time. So there are two important ones you've been working with, which are the global environment, which is your workspace. So when you're looking in R Studio and you see on the right or left-hand side, or not at all, depending on how you've got it set up, all of, all of, oh gosh, wait, wait. Hey stuff here and I've just reloaded this so there's nothing in my environment but usually there'd be lots of lots of lots of stuff there this is actually the global environment which is what you've been working in this whole time it's you know full of um, functions that you might write it's full of variables that you're creating it's full of data frames that are going as you're creating so this is actually the environment you've been working with all this time even if you didn't know it um, the second important one is the idea of a current environment. And the current environment is where code is currently executing. So for example, here, we're back to the toy functions again. And we can actually print the current environment by using a call current env. env. And so I'm just going to run this real quick. Right. So we're inside toy function. And we want to print the current environment. So toy function two, three, prints us this information here. Um, and it runs as normal. The other cool thing we can check is we can check both the current environment and the environment's parents and the current environment of the environment par parents. So bear with me why I did this kind of do, 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 do. Um, when this evaluated, if I did this correctly. Yep. The current environment is here. So we can also print it here. And we can confirm that the current environment, which is outside of the function, is the same thing as the parents of the current environment, which is the function here. So this number here. So toy function two how it knew to look for x in the current environment rather than inside its function is because its current parent was the func was the environment sorry its parent is the environment that is created in so we created toy function 2 in this environment here and its parents we can get by getting environment parents does that make sense okay so what is a parent? A parent is a thing that every environment has. Um, it's basically, you can think of it just one up, one up and it's containing everything else and it's where you create things. So if you don't set a parent explicitly when you're creating an environment, R will use the current environment that you're operating in as the parent environment. So we can create these two environments here um, with this code here. So here is our mummy environment. Um, and we give it something called D, which is going to be four. And we give it E, which is five. So here's our mummy environment. Then we create our little baby environment by calling environment and mommy env, which is this bigger one. 
and then assigning some other things. And then we can confirm that the parent of baby environment is mummy um, by calling an environment. And when I, of course, did this, I was not thinking that it would just give us a random hex code at the time. And then I was like, oh no, that's not gonna be pretty. <laughs> but you'll have to trust me. <laughs> Um, we can also see all of the parents of our environment by just adding an S here, so environment parents, and that will give us basically all of the ancestors. So again, same kind of thing. Um, this will give us the environment parent here, and then it will also give us the global environment. However, there's actually one more environment, which is a an exception to the rule. And this is the idea of the empty environment. So the empty environment is always the very, very last thing that everything is stored in in R. And when you print out the environment parents, just like this with the environment parents, R will usually stop at the global environment, but there's actually more below that. So what do you guys think might be beneath the global environment? Any guesses? I can just hit the run button if we want to see the answer. Doop. Okay, so what's beneath the global environment? So, for example, here, environment requirements, you see mummy, you see the global, and then you see same thing, global, and then you see all of the packages that I have attached auto loads, base, and then finally the empty environment at the bottom. So I didn't quite get this part of the chapter, if I'm honest. So there's this, there's a special assignment tool called supersetting, um, which rather than creating something in the current environment, will set something Rather than creating a new variable in the current environment, it will create a variable in the parent environment. So the example given in the book here is in the current working environment, you create a, a variable called x, you assign it to zero. Now here inside of this function call, you use the super assignment where x is now super assigned to one. We run f of x and now we check the value of x again and now x is actually one. So I thought that's cool. Um, I thought we could use it on environments in the same way as we can use it in functions, but that results in errors and I don't know why. <laughs> so I tried to do a similar thing here. I created mummy environment. I checked that its value was E. Oops, that's not it. Um, Could, um, could it be that it's just working for the functions? Um, because with functions, you have this um, execution environment, right? Yeah. And maybe instead of um, just, just um, assigning the value in the execution environment, you also assign in the current environment. Like. <laughs> also, what if you do it not when you're creating the environment, but when you're, because then you don't have that little arrow assign, you do it with the equals. Yeah, so if you yeah. do it like so I that. So I did try this as well. I double checked this one. Uh -huh. um, and that gives that even more confusing answer to me. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't quite get this because bit. What if you okay? What if you change mummy env e to fish because you're running that in the? Let's see. Maybe it can't find baby env because it's in mummy env. Okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, he he gives it such a <laughs> tiny, tiny little part in the book that, and he also basically says, "Be aware it causes errors." That I almost feel like the entire point of us 
knowing this was to avoid it, but I'm not really sure. No, but assignment is used to create variables, right? And the elements yeah. of the elements of the environment are the variables. They're not, right? Or are they? <coughs> no, I guess they're name binders. Yeah, I guess they're not variables, they're bindings. Is that different somehow? Is that is that different than the way we would normally just say x equals zero? Like would we view it as a different thing? Maybe. No. Just opened the, the help file for the double arrow thingy. And it says that those are usually um, used in functions and cause a search to be made through parent environments for an existing definition of the variable being assigned. If such a variable is found, um, then its value is redefined. Otherwise, assignment takes place in the global environment. So it's a special function assigner. Yeah, I think it's maybe just working in functions and then going up to the global environment to assign the value. So if we, for example, gave baby environment a function definition, um, let's see. this can we change F test no I don't think that's gonna work Ooh. so function specific I mean I'm trying to think of a way that we could have a function inside of an environment and then the function itself changes a the, variable inside of the environment that it's in the thing the function will create its own environment right Function will create its own environment, and then the supersetter will assign it to either the the environment that it's above, or if it's not found to the global environment. So if we had something like, you know, C is four, and then if this guy is writing very bad, um, he's not going to evaluate because I forget how to do anonymous functions. Um, something like C5. Would this then change C in baby environment here? Maybe if you run the function, then you know. I'll go back to your the, to your testing functions. That you had in the previous. Oh, my little test functions. Yeah. Uh, did it... So, to a function, when, when it prints the current environment, it prints its own environment, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the previous function, so create create something that will assign to the environment of the, of the toy function one. Does it make sense? So in toy function two, create a value or a variable that will assign something to toy function one. I mean, if you oh, create something that assigns to toy function two? 
So no, no, it's no, no. Just do x. Yeah, so then this will change the value of x outside here. So then I'll go like this, oh. x. x is now 1 due to this. But I'm guessing if we <clears throat> assign a function and use this laser binding thing, we can also change the if we had a C here, uh, C equals four. And we had a function here that assigns um, Uh, there are still curly braces in line eight instead of the round parentheses. I do. And we say five. If I'm doing this right, I could not find function baby environment. Oh. Sorry. This is the advanced binding thing. A function, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, so can you actually? Can you actually? I think you can. You can bind functions to environments. Um, hey, look at that. So. This is for now. Do we have to call it? Ooh, that's an interesting error. Yeah. Cannot change the line of luck. I think there was also something about locked bindings in the help uh, file for the super. Ooh. So super setting is more complicated than we expect? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it's because C is a thing. C is a thing. So for example, if I go like this, do we think we get the same one? Okay. Cannot change. No, we got nothing. But like, yeah. mm. Mm. what if you try and change D instead of C? Uh, okay, let's see. I mean, I'm sure it won't, but. Hey, it that's a different, different error. Um, because well, I think C is yeah. protect. I don't know why that wouldn't. I don't know why that would matter. Oh yeah, maybe protected. because I've used the letter C and you shouldn't yeah. use C for examples. Does not concatenate? Hey, that didn't do what we thought it was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. 
I said, cool. change the one above, but that didn't. So that doesn't but, look oh, cool. But is that because the function is changing the one in baby env because the function is an environment? But then, no, but then it would just be going up yeah. to... Isn't where, it just supposed to be going up? Just where it, where it should meet it. Okay, right. Search in the current environment, and if not, geez, I don't know. Let's try this. Let's try d equals one. And then let's see. Maybe we're going up too far. Oops. And then. No. <laughs> how, how would you how would you change the name the value of d if you're not using a function? Oh, um, that is the next one. <laughs> so there are ways, of course, to actually change what's in the bag of bindings. Um, so you create an environment like this. So it's very easy to um, you can add new things just by using the normal assignment egg operator. If you ask for unassigned values, that will return you a null. If you are, for example, wanting an error when you're doing debugging or when you're writing code and you want somebody to error out, if there is a unassigned value to a certain environment, you can use environment get, which is from the Rlang package, and that will give you an error. Um, you can add things by environment poke. So that will poke one thing in, a assigned to 100. You can also use environment bind to bind multiple things at once. And then if you want to know if something oops, um, has, okay. so what do you think happens after we run this little block of code where we say environment has A and then we assign E3A to null? What do you think is going to happen to A? It will stay in there, but be null, have the value null. Yay. So yes, it does, in fact, still have the value. It's still there. Um, true. Environment has A. And to remove it, we use the command environment unbind. So there are fancy ways to bind things which is environment bind lazy and environment bind active, which is what I was trying to do in the previous thing. So environment bind lazy doesn't actually bind anything until the first time something is accessed. So that is why I was using like this. Um, environment bind active will recompute every time something is accessed. So you could assign it to a function, for example, that would generate a random number. And every time you looked at f or a function of f, the binding would be different because it would regenerate that. So apparently we're going to use this also later once we get to object-oriented programming and R6 concepts. But just be aware there's two fancy ways to bind things which are lazy and active. Right. So this break. Um, I figured what we we'll do here is someone can Think, take control of the screen and type if you want it, or we can just talk it through. Or we can talk it through. Uh, <laughs> everyone's so excited for that idea. Um, okay, so how can we make a pair of environments that were illustrated by this picture? So basically what we have is we have two um, environments which essentially only contain one another as bindings. I did this exercise and <laughs> now I'm looking back at it and trying to, I'm trying to make sure that I understand it before I say it because I don't want to just Say stuff that I don't necessarily understand. Uh, but if there's a sufficiently long pause, I'll say it. Shall we call it sufficient? Okay. Okay. Uh, so what I did is I created an env called E1. 
uh, mm-hmm. with just assigned and then yeah n and then uh, e2 was the same uh, function of n but then the first argument was dedupe equals e1 is e1 and then there was another line which is e1 dollar sign loop assigned to e2 e2 and then if i and mm. print them then it should yeah should show what is in them and which seems to be the right things and print e2 as loop, which is an environment, and is bound to dedupe, which is an environment. Hooray! Okay. Um, so, if we try to do this, why don't E1 bracket bracket and E vector like this make sense when E is an environment? So basically, why will this fail? That's again with the, um, so you cannot really access anything in the environment with numbers because the elements are not ordered. And I think the second just doesn't work with the single square brackets. Right? Yeah, pretty much. That's, that's my little quiz break. Um, okay. So I wrote this wrong. This is not going to fail if I evaluate it. But the idea, <laughs> because I have ggplot loaded already, um, and I forgot to unload it before we ran. But the idea was, was that I was going to very smartly not have ggplot loaded, and then evaluate <laughs> this line, and it's going to fail, which I'm sure is an error that everyone's done before when you start a new script and you haven't loaded the package that you needed, and you're like, oh, everything's failing. What nonsense. OK. So in theory, that didn't work, but it did. But this should not fail because I'm explicitly calling the library ggplot and then ggplot now exists in my <coughs> call space of place to look. So the reason this works, and this is kind of how packages work conceptually in R, is that every time we add a package with either library or acquire, we're adding to the search path. And I'm not really sure why this picture is so big, but basically you've got the global environment and then a package a package, a package, a package, and a package. So we can look at our entire search environment by using the search, search ends command. And when I call search environments here, um, this is everything that I'm going to look for. I can also check out the parents of the current environment. <coughs> so this will see all of the packages I have loaded all the way down to the empty. Um, What's going to happen to the search environments and the parent environments of the global environment after I load the calplot? So you load calplot like this, and now the parent environment of the global will be calplot, and the search environments first is going to search calplot down to gplot, rlang, backx null, autoload space, empty, etc. So this is kind of conceptually how packages work, and why sometimes when you load one package after another you'll get a lot of um, annoying errors. So one thing that happens to me a lot because I work with genomics data is that many of the genomics packages use a function called select, um, which works very well on genomics objects. And if I load them in the wrong order from uh, tidyverse, I will get some very irritating error telling me I cannot apply that function on a data frame. So I have a tendency where I'm always writing deep liar dot dot, um, which is, by the way, as I think we all know, if you want to specifically call a function from a specific package, you use the dot dot. Um, so kind of as a special environments concept, um, the standard deviation function uses a function from the stats package called var. And so this is what SD looks like. This is its function, basically, how you get the standard deviation of something. You take the square root, variance, um, and you remove 
Thanks, guys. So this is an example. Let's say I make a little vector called x, and I print its standard deviation. And now I make a new variable function called var, which is just going to sample from this. Um, what do we think is going to happen to standard deviation here? Is it going to break? Um, So if I evaluate this, um, so I evaluate the standard deviation of x, which is about 8.3. Um, I create a new function called var. I tell it to basically sample either one of these two. It gives me two. And I call standard deviation again. And I'm still getting the same answer. It's not now just giving me a random different number between one and two. It's still probably correctly calling variance from the stats package. So the reason it's doing this is the concept of namespaces. So functions use the namespaces defined in their namespace environment. And there was meant to be a whole little figure here that has been incorrectly. So I'm just going to pull it over like this. So a function x has both the namespace that it calls from, where it imports from, its base, its package. Um, this got all relatively complicated to me relatively fast. But I have a feeling once we start working with packages, and I've never written a package before, and if you write with packages, conceptually that this all makes sense. Um, from what I gathered, what this basically means is that whenever you're writing a package, you have the names of things to be calling, and you have the things themselves. And linking things together, when you write the package, SD is always going to call its namespace var from the stats package. And whenever it's looking for something called var, it's going to go for the stats package. And that's kind of that functionality is powered by the concept of environments. I think this was also the place where I got lost. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those things I realized as, as we've been reading the chapters, there's a lot of points where I'm just like, I will put a mental pin in this because it's going to make a lot more sense to me. Like, because basically I've noticed as I'm reading, I'm like, oh, that thing makes more sense now. So basically the magic of packages is all but powered by environments, which is why we should give a crap about environments in R. Um, do, do, do. Right, so as we discussed earlier, um, functions also have environments. So again, we make a little toy function. We can print the current environment inside of it. And then we can also print the function environment of a toy function. Um, and this will tell you the environment that this function has been assigned to. So I'm here now in my global environment. Um, and I didn't call the function because I'm a fool. Right. So. The function environment of a function is the environment that's inside of it. As the example, this. So the function environment of toy function is C8. The current environment when we're inside of toy function, C8. And now that we're back in the global, our current environment is C8. So the function, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. The function environment is the environment that the function has been assigned to. So inside the environment, separate, envi inside the function, separate environment, outside the environment, separate thing. The place that it's been assigned to is callable by the function environment. Right. So then we have the call stack. 
So the call stack fit was also somewhat confusing to me, um, but I liked his use of using the idea of traceback and errors. So I think this is something we're pretty used to looking at, or at least I am when I'm writing code, is I write code, it calls a function, which calls a function, which calls a function, and then I have an error and I don't know why I have an error. So you can use the traceback function and this will kind of trace back through the call stack. So what we have here, we have a function called f, it takes an input x, g then takes, it then calls a function g, g is this function here, g calls h, h calls this, basically like any code we write. And because it's got stop here, h is gonna throw an error. Traceback will show us um, what the call stack is, but we can also use the lops call stack to explore the call stack rather than just calling this um, through an error and traceback. So you can do this similar thing, function f, g, h, call f, f will dig down to g, will dig down to h, which digs down to this, the end of your call stack. Um, I tried to do this as an interactive. Um, in Shiny, it's gonna look crazy. So I'm just gonna show you what, <laughs> what the entire call stack <laughs> For this look like. So basically you've got R down, which calls the base, function shiny, 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 try catch. Whoa, 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 all the way down to a call stack. <laughs> um, this can get even more complicated with the concept of lazy evaluation. So we have a function here. A, which calls B of X, B, which calls C of X, and X, which returns A. A, F, um, F being this function up here, calls B, C. This, I wasn't quite getting what was going on here. Um, but if anybody's with me, unless this is just saying that the function here is not actually being evaluated because we're not actually calling f we're just asking it to produce yeah i think it's first like doing the the like this call stack from a to c mm -hmm. and then theoretically you have um x which is f so it's mm -hmm. branching the f somehow to a different call stack and then it's calling f and the, the call stack of f i think but i also didn't quite get why or like yeah. why it's not just branching like why it's not just continuing from c so lazy evaluation was something from the chapter before right with functions that a function doesn't get evaluated until you actually call it. But I'm not sure how this connects totally with this part of the call stack. Um, I'm going to say hit in this as well because it's now uh, 720 and we got 10 minutes, but I don't have that much more to go. I think, I think C when C is finally called has to branch out because it's not in this sort of same tree and this is what so i get down to c and then now i have to call over to f because i don't have anything yeah. to evaluate i think so this function the yeah, it seems like we, we it seems like we're getting two environments for the for the chain right Oh, right. So then by the time I get to X, now I actually have to call F. And that's and so then environment, yeah. like in the same environment. Yeah. Yeah, that could be. Maybe. Because what's, what's F? It's somewhere. F is up here, is this series of functions. Yeah. F was the function that called G, that called H, that called yeah, yeah, yeah. G, X, lobster. <coughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, okay, so useful things for environments. Um, it avoids copying large data sets. So it's a great way to avoid having to copy things if you've got a large data set. It's used in packages that have large data. So uh, again, in genomics, we have um, lots of packages like the entire human genome as an R package, which is just data, um, which doesn't immediately get called in if you call the package until you need to pull it in. Um, it allows you to manage state within a package. So it's what's powering, for example, the fact that standard deviation knows to correctly call the stats var rather than the new stupid var that I created in the previous example. And you can also use it as a hash map um, or like a Python dictionary, which is what I thought of when I first saw it. Like, oh, this is a Python dictionary. <laughs> um, can you go back to the avoid making, making copies? What's, sort of, what's the sort of point? Of oh, that? so so for example, when you're, if you've got, um, let's say you make a, an environment where one of the bindings was to the human genome right. and you wanted to edit the a binding, which was for the name of your sample that you're analyzing. Um, if you were doing it as a named list, for example, when you did that edit, right, you have copy on my So you would have to copy the entire named list of mm -hmm. human genome and the name of the sample in order to edit the name of the sample. However, environments are avoiding that because they don't have the copy on modify functionality. They just have the, um, I can't remember what the other thing is called. They don't copy and modify. So when you change sample name, you don't have to then make a new copy of the human genome. You would just change sample name. Okay. Um, cool, okay. So at the last, I thought we could figure, finish with the quiz questions. Um, we can all try to answer them together. So, woo um, Who wants to take the first one? Anybody? So everything has to have a unique name in the environment and they are not ordered and There were two more. <laughs> uh, there's the thing I just said about the the the, the memory. Yeah. So stuff is not actually loaded until you specifically um, call it. Or I uh, know they the, that they are not copied in. And beyond modify. Or, yeah. And then the last one, unless anybody has a guess for what it is, is um, that environments all have parents. So this is still not parents. Um, what's the parent of the global environment? Yeah, we know that the empty environment, right? Um, so the empty environment. <laughs> empty empty was the very, very last, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the global environment. Um, so when I made baby, inv baby environment, and I asked for his parents, I saw this itself, global, and beneath it, So the parent of the global environment is actually the last package that you have loaded. So whatever the most recent package you've loaded is, is the parent of the environment of the current global environment. And then do, 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 empty is the very last thing, which has no parents, is a sad little orphan. Um, oh, whoops. <laughs> what is the only environment that doesn't have parents? The empty environment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is the closing environment of a function? And if you don't get this right, that's because I explained it very poorly. Good. 
that the function runs in its, in its own environment, right? Yes, the function has its own environment and a function is then enclosed by an environment, um, which is what I was trying to explain here, but did really badly at explaining it. So when I create toy function, the function environment returned by when I call function environment to ask it who it is, is actually the same <clears throat> as our current environment, which is because I created the function inside of the current environment. The function environment is where the function is going to look for variables. So that's why it looked for the variable. If I did this correctly and use the right one. Um, that's why it would correct for the variable X in the networking environment. Um, and the environment of a function is whatever environment you create the function in. And that's where it's going to look for its variables, which is why it is important. And I, I think I explained it very badly, so I just am re-explaining the answer to that one. <laughs> um, how do you determine the environment from which a function is called? And I think I completely missed that. Um, you use caller and end. So we can go back here. Cheers. No, that's not how you use it. I've done it. I've done it wrong. Um, maybe just with the name of the function because it's because in line 13 you're calling toy function with two arguments and one of them doesn't oh, exist anymore okay yes one of them doesn't exist thank you what Um, yeah, this is going really well, guys. This is this is good. I'm real proud of this. Um, let's see. The current environment is the execution environment of the current function, the one being evaluated. And the caller environment is telling you probably. So. Do you have to use it inside of the function? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, is this going to be different? You've got print rather than print. Non <laughs> <laughs> uh, numeric argument to binary operator. What's my broken here? Um, did, I have a did I break toy function? Oh, no. Um. Okay, so and the environment. Yeah. Yep. Nice. So the caller environment tells you where he's called from. Boop, boop. <laughs> Woohoo. Um right. How are these two different? I don't know. One assigns to the current and one to the parent, right? <laughs> yes, that's that's the answer. Um, given a possibly so. avoid the second one until we've learned about 
possibly function yeah. contrary. <laughs> So possibly currently avoid. Um, yay. So that's it. Um, thank you for coming on this journey of me not using our mark dog correctly and not looking at the presentation that I made two weeks ago right before this. So that was fun. That's good. Thank you. I liked having the exercises throughout. I thought that was a good, um, a good approach. Yeah, uh, next next time it'll be more correctly integrated. <laughs>